The forces of the Space Marines have access to some of the most powerful weaponry ever created by mankind. Absolutely brutal guns that deliver the Emperor's wrath to the heretic, the mutant, and the alien alike. And due to their genetically enhanced strength that's multiplied exponentially by the exoskeletons within their power armor, the Space Marines are capable of wielding heavy weaponry that is normally supposed to be mounted on an armored vehicle. And I don't know about you, but for me personally, the bigger the gun, the cooler it is. So today we're going to take a look at some of the heavy weapons utilized by the Space Marines, including some good old favorites like the Plasma Cannon or Multi Melta, and a couple of weird ones like a long range antimatter cannon, and a missile launcher that basically shoots a projectile that's full of the Emperor's dandruff. But for the most part, I'm going to be leaving Primaris guns out of this video, as rather disappointingly, even though the Primaris have been out for several years now. Games Workshop really hasn't given us a lot of the inner workings of some of their more interesting firearms. Like, for example, they have multi-melta assault rifles that fire twice as far and are twice as powerful. And they can also be fired while on the move. How the hell do they work? Who knows? At the moment, the explanation that we're given for how some of these weapons work is basically some deus ex mechanicus from Belisarius Call, which, although funny, it doesn't really make for an educational lore video. So with all that out of the way, let's dive in with possibly the most iconic heavy weapon that the Space Marines use, the Heavy Bolter. But before we get into that, here's a quick shout out to this video's sponsor. Warpath is a free-to-play action war game with realistic military gameplay. It's filled with historically accurate weapons, tanks, planes, and artillery that have been meticulously recreated with a high eye for detail, and all of which are completely modifiable to fit your preferred playstyle. Military buffs will appreciate that the game includes a ton of real-world battlefields, and the campaign allows you to play through a whole host of legendary historic battles. In Warpath, you take command of a prestigious military commander, and you must recruit a diverse array of officers and troops to lead into battle in order to to expand your territory. And despite what the movies may tell you, war isn't all about constant fighting, as your commander will also have to take part in a plethora of diplomatic negotiations. Now just like the real world, resources aren't unlimited, and a good commander needs to know how to use them tactically. You'll need to calculate your troops, weapons, and tactics according to the battlefield situation and use them as strategically as possible. Now let's say your enemy is rolling in with hundreds of tanks. Are you going to send a bunch of infantry at them? Of course not. You bring in the heavy artillery. And Warpath has recently been updated with an entirely new sniper mission system, which allows you to play as a sniper on secret missions in order to take out critically important targets. Now, every action you take is crucial and can net you valuable resources and tactical advantages in the larger war. You'll need to take advantage of the terrain as well as Warpath's bullet time mode in order to eliminate your targets as efficiently as possible. Sometimes a single man landing a well-placed shot can be more valuable than an entire army. Through the game's alliance system, your commander can join in an alliance to avoid costly wars altogether, or even send spies to win the war from the shadows before it even begins. And Warpath is all about the bonds of brotherhood, as the ones developed in battle are deeper than any other. The Brotherhood is one of your main strengths, and by cooperating strategically, you can fight side by side and support one another. Whether this takes the form of sharing valuable resources, or sending in the troops to defend one another when the enemy moves in, this season Warpath is introducing a whole swath of new tournaments, with a combined prize pool of up to $15,000. And everyone has a chance to win. You can download the game for free today by clicking on the link in the video description below. Thanks again to the awesome people over at Warpath for sponsoring this video, and let's get into the grimdark. So bolter weapons are the most common form of gun used by the Space Marines. And unlike many of the other ancient and powerful weapons found throughout the forces of the Imperium, bolt weapons are actually pretty cheap and efficient to make, thus lending to their popularity and widespread deployment. Now, bolters weren't always the Astartes weapon of choice, as they were actually created to replace what were known as Volkite weapons, which we'll cover later in this video. And in order to understand just how crazy the heavy bolter is, we need to know what a bolt weapon does. To put it simply, a bolter weapon is a gun that fires explosive kinetic rounds that utilize a two-stage firing mechanism. First, a conventional charge is utilized to force the bolt out of the barrel of the gun at high velocity. And immediately after the shell is fired, the bullet's built-in rocket thrusters ignite to propel the round further and faster than standard ammunition. The ammunition that a bolter utilizes also has a mass reactive fuse that triggers the bullet to detonate in a fraction of a second after it has penetrated the target, causing the enemy to literally burst from within. The heavy bolter 
has considerably more stopping power and fires much larger rounds than a standard Bolter, allowing the gun to burst apart entire regiments of infantry into red vapor, as well as punch considerable holes into light vehicles. Now, the heavy Bolter differs from the standard Bolter in a variety of ways, some more obvious than others. First and foremost, the heavy Bolter doesn't actually utilize a firing pin mechanism, but instead generates an electronic pulse in order to sustain a much higher rate of fire than your average Bolter. Their shells are also considerably larger, early lore putting Bolter shells at around 75 caliber, whereas the bullets fired by a heavy Bolter come in at 100 cal. Now, that being said, these numbers can tend to be a little misleading, as based on the description of what the Bolter actually does in lore, in addition to just how freakishly large an Astartes Bolter actually is, it's most likely that these numbers were just something that Games Workshop picked because it sounded cool back in the day, even though they don't really make sense with what we're shown. When I was doing research on this, I came across a Reddit post by a user known as Outlaw6, and they did a pretty interesting breakdown comparing the numbers were given by Games Workshop to the actual dimensions of a Space Marine and their weaponry. So I'll throw a link to that down in the comments if you're curious. And although very often mounted on a wide range of Imperial vehicles, the heavy bolter can be wielded by power armored infantry. Now, that being said, there have been a couple of reported instances of exceptionally strong individuals wielding them without any form of brace or powered exoskeleton, such as the famous Katachan gunnery sergeant Stonetooth Harker. But this dude is definitely not normal. Under normal circumstances, a normal human trying to fire such a gun would be hit with such an enormous amount of recoil that it would shatter the wielder's arms. When used by the forces of the Astra Militarum, if they're not mounted on a vehicle, then they require a team to operate, and at the very least, be mounted on a tripod-like stabilizing device. Space Marines, however, can fire them from the hip, using a wide array of target-assisted technology built into their helmets in order to maintain accuracy. They do have to stand still and brace themselves in order to fire them efficiently. However, members of the Death Watch have been known to utilize heavy bolters that have anti-grav technology built into them so they can be fired on the move. Technology like this is pretty rare, so this isn't done very often. Now, because the heavy bolter has such a high rate of fire, it is unfortunately prone to jamming, and thus regular maintenance in combination with the anointing of sacred oils and reciting of the ancient tech litanies by the tech priests of the Mechanicus or chapters tech marines is often required to keep the gun's machine spirit appeased. And now let's talk about a weapon that has an even higher rate of fire, the assault cannon. The assault cannon was developed in the early 31st millennium and was intended to replace autocannons in use by Terminator squads. The assault cannon sacrificed the considerable range of the autocannon for a much higher rate of fire. When utilized at short to medium range, the assault cannon can mow down hordes of infantry in seconds and decimate light vehicles, as the cannon measures its rate of fire in the hundreds of rounds per second. Because it fires so many shots so quickly, the barrels of these guns often need to be replaced after every single engagement. The assault cannon generates a considerable amount of recoil, and thus when utilized outside of the Space Marines, is done so by a dedicated heavy weapons team or is mounted on a vehicle. They are most ideal in close quarters engagements, where the Space Marines are dealing with a whole lot of fast-moving infantry, such as gene stealers or demonettes. In such circumstances, bolter weapons just can't keep up, and without an assault cannon in the group, the squad may quickly be overwhelmed. Thus, the assault cannon fulfills a similar role to a Space Marine wielding a heavy flamer. Both weapons have their pros and cons, and which one the squad will take into battle depends upon the situation. And speaking of the heavy flamer, there's nothing quite as elegantly brutal as a good old fashioned flamethrower. They have survived the test of time, changing very little in their design since the second millennia. It brings to mind the old mantra of, if it's not broken, don't fix it. Flamers are dreadful and feared weaponry, and rightfully so, as burning alive has gotta be one of the worst ways to go. Flamer weapons found throughout the Imperium are fueled with a gel-like substance known as Prometheum. It's a highly flammable compound that ignites the second it is exposed to oxygen. When fired, the gel immediately ignites, and upon making contact with the target, it will stick to them, engulfing them in a blazing inferno that is nearly impossible to put out. The flames can even continue to burn underwater. A variant of the flamer weapon that was used in the past was known as Phosphex weaponry. It was said that the flames of the Phosphex weapons could survive even in the vacuum of space, a truly horrifying weapon of war that thankfully today is incredibly rare. And using of one of these ancient devices is seen as a war crime by many space brain chapters. And that's saying something, considering just how many horrible things happen in the 40K universe all the time. The heavy flamer stands apart from its smaller cousins, the hand flamer or the flamer in that it is considerably larger and utilizes a bigger reservoir of fuel, normally mounted on a Space Marine's back. It also is double-barreled, allowing it to project twice as much burning Prometheum at an increased range, and also at much hotter temperatures. The Heavy Flamer is ideal for compact environments, such as 
jungle fighting, or engagements that take place on ship corridors, and most iconically being utilized by Terminators sent to clear out floating space hulks of nesting gene stealers. And speaking of weapons that get really hot, let's talk about the multi melta All right, so as badass as the multi melta is, it is basically, at the end of the day, a weaponized blowtorch that's been cranked up well past 11. Melted guns work by creating a submolecular reaction within its pressurized fuel mix, and then projects the resulting plasma through the canister and out of the gun, in a beam of superheated energy that obliterates anything caught in the weapon's path. Infantry are completely vaporized, leaving nothing but ash in the wind, and heavily armored targets are reduced to molten slag. Meltas can burn through even the heaviest of armors, and the multi-melta takes two of these ridiculous guns and combines them together, firing both beams simultaneously to create a blinding beam of considerably destructive power. That the lore on the Meltas has never really been that consistent. Some sources say that the resulting energy is plasma, while other sources have depicted it as basically like a microwave gun. Then you have sources that say it's a beam weapon, and then you have things like the Space Marine video game, which treated the multi melta like a shotgun for some reason. So, like a lot of stuff in Warhammer lore, it's one of those things where this is what the weapon does, don't really think about the mechanics too much, because you'll have its mechanics all figured out one day, and then a new book will come out that messes that all up. So on the topic of plasma, let's talk about the plasma cannon, which is a very similar device to that of the multi melta, but works in a slightly different way. I know I tend to call a lot of things from 40k iconic, but I don't really know how else to describe plasma weaponry. The gun that's famous for being just as deadly to your enemies as it is to you. The gun works by creating and storing plasma, and when fired, it unleashes the fury of a stored sun by launching a portion of the superheated matter over a great distance. It does this by utilizing a magnetic accelerator, and although not fully explained, it sure sounds like a similar system utilized in railgun technology. The superheated balls of plasma can be fired incredibly quickly and detonate on impact, turning the wielder's enemies into nothing more than a red mist. And that's just the standard plasma gun, as the plasma cannon, on the other hand, is much larger and capable of dispensing substantially more energy in each shot, creating absolutely lethal fireballs that can cripple and explode light vehicles. Now, most of the bulky and heavy space marine weapons on this list can be utilized by small groups of unaugmented humans. That is not the case with the plasma cannon. There's no plasma cannon heavy weapons team within the Imperial Guard, and that's for a very good reason. Its tendency to overheat and rapidly and violently discharge its stored energy makes it incredibly dangerous. Marines in power armor or infantry inside of a vehicle that the gun has been mounted to have considerably more protection when a setback occurs. But trying to wield a plasma cannon without any form of protection is insanely dangerous. And if this ever occurs, it's normally done by combat servitors that the Imperium sees as disposable. Plasma pistols, on the other hand, do end up being utilized by regular humans. However, if a plasma pistol explodes, it may kill or severely injure its wielder, but the damage will most likely be limited to a single individual. Whereas if a plasma cannon goes critical, it may end up taking out the entire team. So considering that they use similar technology, let's compare and contrast the plasma to the melta. First, the melta is far more simple in design, and without all of those complex working parts to separate the plasma into contained projectiles, there's a vastly reduced amount of points where the weapon could encounter a critical failure. You basically just turn the melta on, and it starts venting its fury into the enemy until you turn it off. Or, as I mentioned before, in short-timed bursts of energy. Depending on the specific type of melta, or what source of lore that particular author decided to go with. Now that being said, because it doesn't have all of the magnetic propulsion systems that apply plasma cannon does, its range is considerably shorter. But that comes as a trade-off, as the beam it produces is capable of doing even more damage the closer the wielder gets to their target. As the beam tends to be the strongest immediately after leaving the barrel of the gun, and slowly dissipating in potency as it is projected forward. So the Melta is more reliable, has considerably more stopping power, and is also a lot safer to use, but at the trade-off of a drastically reduced range. And speaking of beam weapons, let's talk about the Conversion Beamer, an incredibly strange weapon that is admittedly more commonly associated with Space Marine Dreadnoughts than their infantry. But back in the day, a Tech Marine could wield one of these things, so it still fits on the list in my eyes. Now, conversion beamers are incredibly rare, and even more difficult to calibrate and keep functioning. So even when wielded by a tech marine, it's normally a Space Marine chapter's Master of the Forge, which you can think of as the head tech marine. 
On one hand, this is because such an individual may be the only person within a chapter who has the wherewithal to utilize the gun effectively. But it's also stated that the machine spirit of the conversion beamer is incredibly finicky and will take great offense to any but the most enlightened of the machine gods faithful who would attempt to operate it. It is a incredibly bizarre weapon, it most likely originating in the dark age of technology, and it works by projecting antimatter over a vast distance. When a conversion beamer is fired, it emits a stream of neutron bombarded antimatter particles, which set in motion a series of violent chain reactions to occur along the beam's path, gaining in destructive potential the further it travels. And I'm no scientist, and possibly the worst person on the internet to try to explain how antimatter works, but I've kind of written myself into a corner here, so here we go. When antimatter comes into contact with matter, it releases an enormous amount of energy, 2.4 pounds of which could generate enough energy to be the equivalent of the Sar Bomba, the largest bomb ever created in the real world. When the antimatter is released from the gun, it comes into contact with a whole bunch of other matter as it travels through the air, creating further explosive reactions that travel along the path the beam is created, getting stronger and more deadly the further it goes, eventually reaching critical mass, and once it collides with its target, creates a massive explosion. So it's kind of like the exact opposite of a melta, whereas the melta gets stronger the closer you are to the target, the conversion beamer gets stronger the further the target is away from you. And while we're on the topic of energy-based weapons, let's talk about the LAS cannon. Now, LAS weaponry is widely used throughout the entirety of the Imperium, and most iconically being associated with the forces of the Astra Militarum, as the humble LAS rifle is standard issue gear for them. The LAS cannon, on the other hand, utilizes similar technology as a LAS rifle, but on a much larger scale. Now, the best thing about a LAS cannon is it's incredibly reliable and not prone to failure, as this technology has been utilized for tens of thousands of years. It's simple in nature and doesn't have a lot of moving parts. The major difference between a LAS gun and a LAS cannon is the size and weight of the weapon, along with just how much energy is outputted with each shot. Although unfairly given the reputation of being about as effective as a flashlight, the LAS gun is kind of a remarkable weapon. Uh, they're very well built and can fire an estimated 10,000 shots before needing to be replaced. Its design is simple, elegant, and robust, and it's really difficult to break. A shot from a LAS gun hitting an unarmored target can leave a smoking crater in their chest or send severed limbs flying. The LAS cannon, by comparison, is vastly more powerful and can punch holes clean through tanks at a considerable distance away, while maintaining that famous reliability and accuracy of their smaller counterparts. They do unfortunately require an enormous amount of energy, depleting the cannon's entire charge pack with every single shot, leading to long reload times and making it more suited for long-range engagements. Moving on to the Grav Cannon, and to be fair, I've spoken about this in a few other videos, so I'm going to keep it short, as to not be reiterating something I've recently talked about. So gravity-based weaponry works by turning the target's own weight against them, causing the armored form of a Dreadnought or a Terminator into less of a protective suit and more of a metal tomb, as the power of the gun crumbles the individual like a soda can, the metal walls of their armor crushing in from all sides, cracking bones and rupturing organs. They're pretty bizarre weapons, but are definitely very efficient. Now let's move on to a strange weapon that, outside of the Mechanicus, we don't really see utilized too much in the 41st millennium. They're what is known as Volkite weapons, an ancient form of thermal heat ray based weaponry that fires a continuous beam that superheats the target to ludicrous levels, quite literally causing them to burst into flames inside of their armor. Now, if the beam maintains prolonged contact with the target, its temperature can increase to the point that they will burst into flames and spread fire to all their allies around them. And although ceramite armor does offer some protection, even its heat-resistant alloys can be penetrated by the Volkite's deadly beam. Now, the Volkite Cauldron is the heaviest version of Volkite weapon that can be wielded by infantry, and because of this, it's more commonly associated with Contemptor Dreadnoughts. Fun fact, Volkite weapons were actually the standard-issue weaponry utilized by the Space Marines before the invention of the Bolter. These guns were incredibly effective, but unfortunately, also really difficult and expensive to manufacture. And as the Space Marine Legions kept expanding and the Great Crusades started taking off, they were eventually phased out for the iconic bolters, as they were also incredibly effective and a lot easier to produce. Nowadays, surviving Volkite weapons are incredibly rare, and to wield such a weapon is a sign of a remarkable elite status. Unfortunately, the lore on the Volkite culverin in particular is rather scarce, and not really sufficiently fleshed out. The major takeaway is that it is substantially larger and heavier than a standard Volkite weapon, and is able to dispense much more energy over a greater distance. So bigger, better, and hotter, but also a lot clunkier. 
The Cyclone Missile Launcher is a shoulder-mounted missile system that carries up to a dozen long-range ballistic missiles and works in tandem with the advanced targeting arrays within a Terminator's helmet to give the guided missiles deadly accuracy. And the major benefit of it being shoulder-mounted is that since the Terminator's hands are both free, they can still utilize a variety of different weapons, and most commonly wielding a Storm Bolter in one hand and a form of melee weapon in the other. Now this turns the Terminator into a truly deadly instrument of war that is the bane of infantry and armored foe alike, making them efficient killing machines from melee to long range. The launcher is most commonly equipped with a combination of crack and frag missiles. Crack missiles affect a smaller area than their frag counterpart, but their explosive payload is much more concentrated, allowing them to burst apart vehicles and penetrate heavy armor, whereas frag missiles are less concentrated and disperse a large amount of shrapnel over an area, making them far more efficient at dealing with groups of lightly armored infantry. Now, the only major downside is that it adds a considerable amount of weight to the bearer and makes them much less mobile in battle. And speaking of missile launchers, let's talk about the regular good old fashioned Space Marine missile launcher. And at the end of the day, it works like pretty much every other missile launcher you've ever heard of. And honestly, there's not too much to say about its construction. The missile launcher has stood the test of time as a deadly and efficient instrument of war. However, I will point out that there is a difference between a rocket launcher and a missile launcher, something that admittedly took me an embarrassingly long time to figure out. A missile launcher fires guided missiles, whereas the rocket launcher is more of a point and shoot device. But to me, what makes the Space Marine missile launcher so interesting is honestly, it's ammunition. Now, crack and frag missiles are the most common, but there is a wide range of bizarre and esoteric missiles that have been used by Space Marine Devastator squads as well, such as the anti-plant missile, which is exactly what you think it is, a missile whose payload contains a voracious cocktail of toxins and viral agents designed to quickly and efficiently eradicate plant life, thus denying cover to the Space Marine's enemies. There's also haywire missiles, which emit a violent electromagnetic pulse that disrupts any machines or war gear that utilize electricity, shutting down energy weapons, bionic systems, vehicles, and anything else caught in the blast radius. And my personal favorite, the bizarre psych out missiles, whose warhead contains dust that forms from the body of the emperor of mankind, a byproduct of his immense and powerful psychic workings within the golden throne. The dust is collected by the custodians and then provided to the mechanicus, who then implement them into the psych out missiles warheads. When the missile detonates, the dust will be scattered over a wide area, creating an anti-psychic field that cuts off psychers from the warp, disabling their ability to cast potent sorceries and leaving them vulnerable to the weapons of the Space Marines. So yes, you heard that right. The Emperor of Mankind is so goddamn powerful that even his dandruff can be turned into a weapon of war. And that's it. That's all of the heavy Space Marine weapons I wanted to talk about today. Are you a fan of the good old fashioned heavy bolter? Or are you more of a heavy flamer kind of person? I'm definitely a bolter kind of guy. The storm bolter being my favorite weapon of all time. And I really wanted to put it on this list, but it's not really a heavy weapon, so... I'll have to end up covering it in a different video. And if you like this type of content, consider subscribing to the channel and dropping a like on the video as it seriously helps me out. <laughs> and I'm gonna be completely honest with you, as of the time of recording this, it's about 4.30 in the morning, so I'm gonna go to bed. Thanks for hanging out with me tonight, you guys, and I'll catch you all in the next one.